Today is October 24th, 2022. Coming up on Our Voices, we're going to have the mayor of Charleston, West Virginia, and we're going to speak with her concerning her run for a second term as mayor of the capital city. This is Our Voices. Let's go. Five, four, three, two, one. To our voices, I have a special guest with me. She is the mayor of Charleston, West Virginia. She is the Honorable Amy Schuler Goodwin. Madam Mayor, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful, Ray. Thanks for having me on your show. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for coming on. Uh, I know it's been a long time. Um, like I said, I've been, you know, we've been trying to meet up and everything. You've been pretty busy also uh, these past four years. Um, before I get to my questions, Madam Mayor, uh, please tell the audience who Amy Shula Goodwin is. Gosh, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ray. Thanks for always doing this show. I do watch. Um, I'm a loyal fan. And so I watch every episode that you post. So thanks for doing thanks for doing these shows. Um, I grew up in um, West Virginia. I am. My story is probably similar to so many folks who grew up in West Virginia. Uh, my mom was a school teacher and elementary school teacher. My dad um, was a teacher as well. And then he started a small business. Um, I have a sister and we spent most of our time, our nights, our weekends and holidays uh, in our store. Uh, my dad is a small business owner, as I said, and we've just spent a lot of time um, with them. In our family business. And if I wasn't at work stocking shoes or running the cash register, I'm an excellent, excellent, excellent uh, clerk. Uh, when you start at 11 years of age and your dad tells you get on the cash register, you're really good at it. So it's a skill set most people don't know that I have. Um, we spent a lot of time with my grandparents, uh, Thais and Albert Blatnick, and who spent a lot of their time in education. My grandmother, Thais Blatnick, was one of the very first female um, senators here in West Virginia. She was, um, it's where I get my height, my towering height. She was four feet, 11 inches tall, Ray, but she, um, she made her presence known and she fought for women and children with exceptionalities. And, um, I think about her every, every day. Um, I graduated high school. I was that kid who did every sport. Um, I, we just were, a uh, sports, centered family. So I played basketball and volleyball and softball. And I actually even played on the men's golf team when I was in school and high school. Uh, I went to West Virginia University, got a degree in journalism, um, lived overseas for a little bit, being a researcher for a news organization, ABC News, and came back to West Virginia uh, to do what I love to do, which is write and read and communicate. And that's how I got my start in the policy and political world. I've been a communications director for uh, congressmen, several governors, um, and the late G. Kemp Mountain. Um, and I've been in Charleston for, gosh, she was uh, 27 years now. I married a really cute, good-looking guy from Jackson County, Booth Goodwin. And we have two boys, Joe and Sam, who are now both in college. So I'm the mom of college kids. Well, must be nice. It is. It's I, great. I it's have great. one. I have one. You know, one's in two years. I, I know. I know. I know. Beautiful. You have beautiful babies, and really, they're the reason why I ran four years ago. Um, plain and simple. It sounds like I'm re reciting a bumper sticker or a campaign slogan, but they really were the reason why I decided to run years ago, Ray. Um, I just didn't like the direction and having been in politics for so long, um, I sat down with Booth one night and said, I think I can do this. Uh, and he said, I think you can too. And so 
we didn't know, but four years ago, I became the first female mayor of the city of Charleston. And even though it has been a really trying four years for not only Charleston, but the nation going through a global pandemic, I have loved every minute of it. I really have, even in the even in the difficult times, Ray. Madam Mayor, you 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 chosen the path of going into politics. Um, you have turned this city, uh, I mean, upside down for the good. Uh, we've, we've tried. We, we've you know, we've tried, Ray. Uh, of course, when it comes to uh, politics, you know one has to have an agenda. Do you feel that your agenda has been complete? Well, they should, you know, I'll say this, you should have an agenda, you should have a vision and you should have a plan. And if you don't, you shouldn't run, period. You know, people say all the time, well, a couple of things you need before you run, you need money and you need connections. No, actually you need to have a plan and you need to have a vision and you need to have an idea of at least what you're going to do. Um, and you have to be flexible uh, and malleable that things change in government. You you know that in our, in our community. So yeah, we came in with a plan. And I say we, because I am one of 775 employees in the city of Charleston. I'm just one. I get to be mayor, but I am a member of an incredible team, the youngest and the most diverse team ever in the history of the city of Charleston. And I truly believe, Ray, that's why we got so much stuff done. Um, we hit the ground running. Uh, we settled up a $3 million deficit in our first year. Uh, we have created, which we really don't talk about a lot, and I don't know why we don't. We have created the largest rainy day fund ever in the history of the city of Charleston. Uh, we brought back baseball. We brought back the regatta. We doubled um, the paving budget. We tripled the amount of demolitions of dilapidated structures. We um, uh, got grants to help redevelop the riverfront. We built parks. We built the first skate park. We built the first open basketball courts on the west side. We revitalized the east end with Dixie Street Park because that was... Ray, four years ago, that's where I actually have my press conference at Dixie Street Park. And if you don't know about Dixie Street Park on the East End, if, if you don't live in that area, you probably wouldn't know about it because it just was an empty lot. And they they built this um, really nice kind of um, pavilion looking thing, but there was nothing in there for the kids to do. So we partnered with AARP. Um, so there is some unbelievable equipment, outdoor equipment like a treadmill, an outdoor treadmill, outdoor bikes, uh, swings for the kids, a splash pad for the kids. But our, our focus has always been um, on kids because when I ran uh, the first time, I walked to 11,219 doors in every zip code across the city. And everybody said, do something for our kids. Almost at every door, maybe not every door, Ray, but you know, at least every other door. It was do something for the kids. Um, we've turfed 10 fields. We're spending $8 million turfing fields, um, giving them a good, safe place to pay. We, we built the first skate park, uh, as I mentioned. Um, and that actually, if I can write, came from a conversation that we had on the West Side. And it came at the Second Avenue Community Center. I, I feel like you were there, but um, there are so many of our community members that came out because the kids said, we feel like we're not being listened to. And we said, you know what? You're right. All the adults, you be quiet. Stop talking. You don't get to say anything <laughs> during these two and a half hours. And Lakeisha Baron Brown, who is amazing um, uh, activist, um, in, inspirer, motivator. I don't, she's the person I call if I really need advice and counsel. I call, I call Lakeisha Baron Brown and Leisha Lee and Hollis Lewis and there are a whole bunch of other other folks. I'm sure I'm going to miss somebody, but we called it a teen town hall. And out of that teen town hall, those kids said to us, you know what? You 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 say you support us, but why don't you do something for us? We said, OK, great. Like what? And they said, build us a skate park. We're like, um, oh, OK, that's how the skate park came about, literally from that teen town hall on Second Avenue. And don't put it somewhere that I can't get to. OK. 
heard you. Uh, get somewhere where I can walk to or bike to. Um, it's the busiest park we have in the whole city, Ray. Busiest park we have. That's, so, that's wonderful. That's that's great. Yeah, Madam Mayor, um, you have turned the transit ball into Slack Plaza. Yeah. Describe the vision and and. and who planted that seed of building Slack Plaza there? Well, I ran on it as a way to not just spend city money, but invest in the city um, and in every area of our city. Um, so Slack Plaza um, City Center, we call it City Center at Slack Plaza, has been talked about, gosh, she whiz, for how long? Um, when we When we got here, a brick had not been replaced in like 20 years. Um, and we just said, it's if you look at Charleston from above, right, in these 33 square miles, but if you look at downtown Charleston, city center is in the middle of the city. Um, and it connects so many of our wonderful resources, right? The Capitol, Clay Center, the market, um, the $100 million renovation that was just done at the Coliseum and Convention Center. You've got had that. So downtown, if you look at it, and you have to have a thriving downtown to have a thriving city. You, you have to. I mean, the meat and potatoes of our business community and our traveling public, they come to downtown first. We live in our neighborhoods, right? Our communities all around us. But what can we do to inspire um, more development? And so we spent uh, $3 million of city funds on that park. And I remember, <laughs> like it was yesterday, so many people saying, well, you're building a park. You think that's going to turn the city around, Amy? Well, no, it's not going to turn the whole city around, but you have to invest in the right places at the right time, right? And so what we did uh, was we did that. And since then, Ray, we've seen a return on investment of close to $50 million just in that area because more people are buying up those buildings um, they're starting restaurants. I mean, Dem Two Brothers is just getting ready to launch here soon. Um, Nancy Bruns with JQ, the JQ Dickinson Salt family just bought, you know, huge apartments down there, renovated them. They're beautiful. Uh, the Greater Canal Valley Foundation under the leadership of uh, Dr. Michelle Mickle Foster um, has landed in that, Fife Street Brewing. And when we went to these folks who said, we're thinking about moving down here, Amy, we're thinking about investing, I said, well, here are the plans that we're going to, you know, implement in city center. And so you have to have community buy-in to do something, but you can't just build a park and then sit on it. So it's a, it's an area that has had tremendous growth um, because we invested in a park, but so is the East end and so is the West side. And so when you, when you make those right investments um, in the right locations, you know, good things happen. A certain individual on social media posts different pictures of what Charleston was like back in the day. Uh, the initials are JT. And they mention about how businesses were thriving back in the day where you know folks would shop and, 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 and do what they got to do, buy what they want to buy. And it's gotten to the point where it businesses just ran away. But now you you are reversing that and bringing it back to where it's more more foot traffic in, in, in Charleston. Like I said, more, more options uh, and more restaurants. So I'll say this about I'll, I'll say this about the the small business. We, you know, again, I go back to the I go back to the beginning, Ray. I, I grew up in a small business. And so I know how. I know how hard it is for small businesses, which, you know, everybody says, oh, it's the meat and potatoes. It's the backbone of our economy. They're not kidding. It is. Um, but when is the last time somebody came in and said to a small business, hey, they never did with my with my with my family business. Hey, you're doing great. Every single time we come and ask you for a donation for the Little League, can you sponsor their team? Can you do the shirts or can you? you know, give somebody a free golf bag at this charity golf tournament. You know, we never turn them down. When's the last time they came in and said, how can we help you grow your business? What can we do to help you? Um, can we help you build 
you know, a, an ADA ramp. Um, so more people can get in your business. Can we buy awnings for you? So, you know, the, you can cut down on your heating bill that, you know, for the sun not to shine right through your door. Can we buy new logos for your door or new windows or new carpeting or, or help with equipment? And so um, also what we started in the Goodwin administration is a small business grant. And we have given out over $800,000 in small business grants. Now, why do we do that? Well, the money that we used to start that came from the water settlement money. Remember when we had a water crisis? With right. Our, crisis, yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so the settlement money that we had, we said, OK, small businesses, so many of them were so impacted by this. Uh, let's start a small let, let, let's use this as seed money and use it as a pilot project. See how successful it is. Since then, City Council has now seen the return on investment that you get by just giving a business, and especially, by the way, Ray, during a pandemic, where so many of them had to close their doors, turn off their lights, because we asked them to, um, so many of them struggled. It could not have come at a better time in that it's so successful that we're now getting council to uh, approve that as part of our budget. So it's a it's a project that we started, um, but one that we think will help small business. Um, but we have more small businesses opening up in the city than we've had in two decades. So I'm really proud of that. Madam Mayor, one of the things folks are mentioning about was wanting a grocery store on the East End. Yeah. There used to be one, uh, I think, almost 30 years ago. Uh, That's right. And then they, they moved out. Um, there was a Kroger. There was a Kroger there, Ray, because I used yes. to shop there. Yes. Uh, I'm sure some residents want to know, um, is it possible to have another grocery store on the East End? I think it is possible, but me just wanting one and residents just wanting one uh, are certainly not going to just make it happen because they look at uh, where people can buy and where people can shop what we've done. You know, not only do we need a grocery store on the East End, we need a grocery store on the West Side too, Ray. Um, and so what we've done is we've worked on a pilot program with the Keep Your Faith um, Corporation. I don't know if you know one of our superstars in our community, Jarrell Miller, um, and his organization to start an open air food market and petite grocery store. Um, do I think we need one? Yeah, I had a home there with two babies. And I can't tell you how many times either I would go or more than likely not Booth Goodwin would go in the middle of the night to go get diapers at 7-Eleven or milk or bread. And let me tell you the cost of buying, um, you know, those types of necessities at a convenience store are far and away more. Do we need one? Yes but it's going to be a long-term project. That's that's for sure. And we have to have the need um, that's there. And what that is, is creating more housing opportunities. You know, there's a couple of developers right now that are looking into building and buying more housing on the East End. That is helpful because when developers look at building um, places or establishing um, uh, uh, markets, uh, they look at the population and they look at the traffic. So it's a numbers game, especially for national organizations. So, and I know some people are saying, you know, if we need one, we need one. And maybe you, maybe you're just going to have to just explain to them the numbers and just, I, I hate to say this, uh, dumb it down and not trying to insult someone's intelligence, but kind of spoon feed them what you're saying, which, which, what, why, and why is the long term project? Uh, Madam Mayor, you you brought back Regatta. Gosh, that was scary. I, I, you, <laughs> you, you, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I haven't gotten to the hard part yet. Though, yeah. it's, questions. it's coming. Good. You brought back Regatta, and yeah. Regatta came. No, Regatta was scary. Bringing it back was scary, right? Because we were nervous when we said to our senior staff team, "We're going to bring it back." Everybody said. Oh, gosh, I hope it's as successful as it's been in the past. I mean, you know, 
bring it back was not an easy decision, especially after a pandemic. So I know you think this is an easy question. It was it was a uh, leap of faith, right? Uh, it was saying to the Charleston community, OK, y'all, you said you wanted this back. Support this. Let's let's give it a go. Let's see what happens. Um, and yeah, you're right. It, it was beyond our wildest dreams. Thirty one point five million dollars return on investment is in, is insane. I didn't think that I honestly did not know it was going to be that successful. We're thrilled. It was crushingly hard on so many people, but it was fabulous. I mean, I saw the pictures. <laughs> you didn't come to regatta. I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. I, yeah, I saw the pictures also. And I mean, I'm thinking when I first came here to West Virginia and a couple of people said, let's go to Bogota. I never knew what it was. And yeah. when I saw it, I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. And then because there was a break where I guess they stopped, they stopped with Bogota because right. they, they said that the violence and, and, and the drinking and what have you. But again, but you brought it back with the vengeance. And again, you have. And there was not one arrest during the entire That's four good. and a half days. Not one. That is good. That is good. Not one. Um, because it was a four day, three, four day event. Yeah, four and a half, really. Four and a half. Are yeah. you going to push it to a seven day week long event? No, no, no. Just because something's good doesn't mean, you know, it's like it's like makeup. More is not more. You don't need more sometimes. <laughs> sometimes yeah. you need less. Okay. More is not more. Um, it, it has to be the right recipe. Right. It has to be the right fix. And, you know, when you when you say, oh, that's so great. Why don't you add on a day? No, 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 no. This came back as a pilot project to say, can we do this? The answer is yes, we can. Right, right. The answer is yes. But slow growth. And I think we hit the right mix. As a matter of fact, I went up, I was at a high school yesterday and I was talking to kids and they loved it. They loved it. They loved it. And they said, we can't wait to bring it back. Please don't move it because it was really great because we never have anything to do during 4th of July. And a lot of our, you know, a lot of people stay here for 4th of July. People tell me all the time, oh, well, that's a bad time. Everybody vacations. Well, not everybody leaves or not everybody can afford just to fly around the country or drive around the country and go on vacation. So it's a vacation at home. So these high schoolers yesterday said to me, uh, Miss Amy, don't don't move it from Fourth of July. I said, well, right now it is going to be on Fourth of July because I have 33 stern whalers that have said to me and committed. Not only will we be back next year in 2023 on the fourth book us. This is a perfect weekend for the Stern Whalers. And it is the Stern Whale Regatta, right? So, you know. The library. Who, who, who in the world designed <laughs> that library? Because again, it's, it's kind of like a five-star hotel. Yeah. The books. I, know. I, okay. know. I, I mean, it, it is real nice. I, it's I, so I, great. I love it. I love um, it. So tell, me, t tell me, uh, what are the reviews on the library? Because again, yeah. and a lot of folks just haven't checked it out. If you haven't been to the library, you've missed the boat. I mean, get get on it now. Get to the library. Um, it's, I asked that question of the kids yesterday too, Ray. And they were like, oh, we love it. It's so much fun. Because here's the other thing that our kids, you know what our kids want, Ray? Our kids want exactly the same thing that you and I want. Like tonight, let's go get something to drink and sit around and talk to each other. Well, that's what they want. And they want fun, bright colored chairs and nice lighting and beautiful. They want the same thing you and I want. And so the library gives that to them. You've got me a cup of there. You can bring in your own drinks and they sit around and you get this great independent feel, right? If you're in high school. So the obviously the city of Charleston uh, supported this project um, as we do and have funded um, every year um, uh, money from our budget that goes directly to the library. But kudos to Prey Construction, kudos to uh, Monica Janison and Tom Haywood and all of the folks that really helped build that library. And I will also give credit where credit is due, their executive director, the thing that is is Erica Conley, who I, I love, Ray, and she's doing an amazing job because one of the very first conversations she had 
um, was about, and the conversation we always have with her is about, okay, great, the library is downtown. Can everybody get to the library? Sean Hill does a great job. KRT system, it's fabulous. Great transportation system. How are the kids from Kanawha City or how are the kids from the West Side or how are the kids from South, how are they all getting to the library? Because I know my boys are a little older now, but when they couldn't drive, how are you going to help them get there? And so transportation, we could do a whole show on transportation, right? Because I think transportation is the way to freedom. It's the way out of poverty. It is the way out of bad health, transportation and access to good, reliable transportation. We, You and I could do a whole show on that. But doing uh, petite library pop-ups and opportunities to get kids from the East End and the West Side and South Hills and Canal City and North Charleston to the library is a focus of this administration at the library. Um, and that's something people don't talk about. But she would be a good she'd be a good person on your your show to talk about what she's doing to connect our kids. OK, OK. I'm your field producer now, too, Ray. So well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're well, welcome. Send it for me. Send it for me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah. Now, here comes the hard part. The, the, yeah, hit me. Okay. Madam Mayor, the West Side, some folks are saying that the West Side is forgotten. Some folks are saying that uh, no money, no monies are being uh, uh sent over there for like rehabilitation or just 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 upkeep and things like that um i believe um uh buford i call him buford but you know big l he uh he mentions about well someone said about wanting street lights in his neighborhood what do you say about that yeah so I say that there is absolutely no question about it, that the West Side has been neglected for 25, 30 years, but not under this administration. Um, and that is because not only did we double paving budgets and efforts, um, we have torn down 400 dilapidated structures over the past four years, right? 400. Far and away, the majority are on the West Side. Want to know why? Because it wasn't done because we allowed dilapidated structures just to sit there. Um, doubled the paving budget. When I got here, you know, the West Side wasn't on the paving list. And we said, why? And what we were told was, well, it's the flats. And we normally salt and scrape the hills. And there's those are the roads that don't really need um, major up, uh, upkeep and upgrades. Now, every single ward, and we have 20 wards in the city, all get a paving project every single cycle. What's significant, I think, about when people say money isn't being invested on the West Side, then sit down with me and let's talk about the numbers. We just had a great meeting um, with a lot of folks from the West Side two weeks ago, actually at the library, it was super fun. Um, $10.5 million, the majority of our American Rescue Plan funds, $10.5 million, just this calendar year went to the west side far and away more than any other area of the city because there is there are so many disparities there are so many issues that we have on the west side and you're right it's it's uh you know i always use the analogy that you know you're more than just a court low um and when we get complaints in our office of you only spend money on the west side and you only spend time on the west side it's because the west side has been neglected the longest so your, your viewers are not wrong. Um, but over the past four years, that has been far and away a different story. And we have the numbers and the investment to prove it. And it's not just about dumping money into the West Side. It's about making strategic decisions. Um, no other area of the city got a brand new park with brand new basketball courts and brand new um, playground equipment, which is on back order because everything is on back order right now. Our, our new Beatrice Street Park. Um, we're working with AEP. It takes a long time to do an assessment of six thousand lights but we did every area of the city 
Um, do we have a long way to go? Oh my gosh, we have such a long way to go in so many different areas of our city. Um, but I take exception to that because I'm really proud of the work that we've done on the West side. And I know this as sure as I'm sitting here in my home office chair, Ray, I spend more money, more time, more energy, and we spend more effort on the West side than we do almost every other part of our city because it needs it. And it is important to us. And I feel confident about that. And I will challenge anyone um, and work with anyone and talk to anyone about the efforts that we've made on the West side. Madam Mayor, uh, when you first started <clears throat> your term, it kind of started on a on a rocky note because there was an incident on the west side with Charleston police. That's right. And you had a town hall meeting at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Tell me, what is the state of the Charleston Police Department now? Is it better? And how much better? Sure. So I think the most important thing that we did, um, and I'll be honest with you, right, it was the, it was, I, I could probably count five, you know, on a handful of times. Um, some of my hardest nights um, in the city of Charleston as being mayor. That was one of them. That town hall meeting was probably one of my most difficult nights as mayor because what we did and what we said was, listen, we are accountable to every resident and we are going to host a town hall and we are going to sit there and we are going to listen and respond as best as we can um, to the concerns of our community. And we didn't do, we listened, but we didn't do a very good job explaining. We didn't do a very good job communicating that night for sure. And for a variety of different reasons, I think we, you know, some of us looked at it as a sit there and listen don't open your mouth. This is a time for the community to tell us what their their challenges and concerns are with us. Um, and so maybe maybe we didn't handle it as best as we could. But what I'm most proud of is you don't hide behind a desk. You don't hide in City Hall. Um, you get out in the community and say, how can we make it better? We partnered with um, Ron English, um, our chief of police, Tyke Hunt, um, when he took over soon, soon thereafter said, you know what? We need to make changes. We need to make changes. We need to be more transparent. Help us figure it out. So we started the C-Core team and the C-Core team has been meeting. As, as a matter of fact, the reason why I'm close to Lakeisha Barron Brown and Michael Farmer and Pastor Collins and a couple other folks who always show up to our meetings, Courtney Campbell, um, she's a, another one um, who's always there to listen to the hard things that we need to hear. And begin to have better relationships because this is what um, we know that when you have your first interaction with a police officer, most of the time it's not good. It's, it's just not good. And so how do we improve that? And so we started a mandatory emotional intelligence training um, and we worked with Reverend English on this and it has been Absolutely. And Errol Randall and um, a lot of other uh, officers that we have. And it has just been amazing. It's been really hard to take. I even took the test and even went through the training about um, implicit bias and the bias that you have. Um, and so many of us honestly took it and went, oh, gosh, I go. I think that I don't have any bias. Oh, yes, you do. And you need to be better about recognizing them and how you respond. And so we all went through um, that training and that program, as all of our officers do. And our officers would tell you far and away, was it hard? Yes. Am I a better officer because of it? Yes. Um, and, it, you know, when you do self-reflection, um, it doesn't matter what you're self-reflecting on. Oh, gosh, why am I not losing weight? Oh, my gosh, why am I not you know, uh, having better results with my relationships or with my work. It, you have to look inward because you are you are half of whatever that equation is, right? You are half of whatever that equation is. And I think that um, since that time, we've gotten better. Are we perfect? No. But have we gotten better? Yes. And this is 
this is what I know. And again, it, it sounds like it's just a, a bumper sticker saying, but we have really good people that really want to do the right thing. Always we want to do the right thing, but we're humans and we make missteps and um, we, we second guess ourselves or we question ourselves and that's okay. Um, but I do believe that far and away, Ray, we are good people here in the city that want to do, uh, want to do good. We really do. Two more things and I'm going to uh, let you go. You are being, well, you have been, you still are, and you will still be, you, you're going to get attacked about two issues. One, the drug situation, drug use, and the homeless situation. Madam Mayor, I have defended you, oh, thank you. time after time because, and folks don't want to hear this. And again, when it, when it comes to politics, I will argue, debate, and make my case, and I'll, I'll prove my point. A lot of folks are saying that you haven't done anything about the homeless situation. And I said, well, if you want to look at the root of the problem, I said, well, Danny Jones had four terms as the mayor of West Virginia, 16 years. And nothing's been said about that. But you come into a situation where, um, again, homeless, uh, the, the homeless situation is pretty, uh, it's pretty obvious. And yet folks are saying that you're not doing anything about it. Sure. Please yeah. Your that. yeah. Thank you so much, Ray. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. If um, Glenn Elliott, the mayor of Wheeling, if Kevin Knowles, the mayor of Martinsburg, if Steve Williams, the mayor of Huntington, um, if Chris Tatum, the mayor of Barbersville, if Scott James, the I could name every single mayor in the state because I'm a member of the West Virginia Municipal League. And you know what every single mayor would say? It's a challenge in every city. And we all are working on ways that we can do better. But let me tell you what we actually did when we got here. We didn't just say, it's a problem. We need to do something about it. When I walked to those 11,219 doors when I was going in the campaign, people had talked to me about this. And they're intertwined. You can't talk about the unsheltered population, Ray, without talking about those with substance use disorder and those who are experiencing mental illness. You can't. And if you separate those, you don't understand the problem. You can't separate them. And so for four years, what we've done is we have built a team. As a matter of fact, our team was just in Pittsburgh last month and they were lifted up as a model of what cities need to do. And so what our care team does, the coordinated addiction response effort team, five members, every single day go out in the community they build relationships they build trust they put people into recovery they connect people back with their families they help people get birth certificates and driver's licenses and their GEDs and into housing and into um you know health uh, you know medical appointments i'm more proud of our care team than almost anything and people will throw stones all day long but again Look at the numbers. There are fewer unsheltered people in the city of Charleston than in the past decade. That's not my opinion, Ray. That's just a fact. But what we see right now in the people that you see struggle with mental illness. Again, I go back to this great group of kids, these high school kids I was talking to yesterday, um, who said, well, can't you just put them into housing the same? Absolutely. Sure, I can. My problem is not getting people into housing, Ray. It's keeping people in housing. It's keeping people in their apartments. It's keeping them on their medicine if they need it. It's keeping them in recovery, which recovery is more than just um, a three week or six week program. And most people that we see that we put into recovery, it takes time and time again. People that are watching your watching your podcast are going to shake their head and go, it's not one time. It's time and time again. It's consistency. And the, the best thing that our care team does, and we have the numbers to prove this as well, just, for, just from the beginning of this year, just from January 1st of 2022, we've reached out and made connections with 311 people who are in a mental crisis state. 
Shelly Moore Capito came through for us just a few months ago and said, you know what? You do need help with mental mental health. And so she gave us a million dollars to help us with our crisis intervention team to help those who are suffering. So I'll give credit where credit is due. But it's hard, Ray. We put in the hard work every day. So people people may criticize or people may throw stones. That's not what I'm interested in focusing my time on. My time is focused on Kevin and Taryn and Danny and our entire care team that are out there making connections. We have so many people that are in recovery right now. That's what we should be celebrating. You know, Ray, nobody ever asked me about that. How many people have you put into recovery? How many people have you put um, into um, assistance or reunited back with their families? 189 since January. 189 folks back with their families. Those are the numbers that I focus on. Is it a struggle? You betcha every single day. This isn't an issue like me paving your road, Ray. I can pave your road tomorrow. This is a long-term problem that's impacting everybody. We have a five-year strategic plan and it's working. Slowly, yes. We take one step forward, we take three back. But what I'm proud of, of this administration, is that we addressed it and we're working on it. And it is the hardest thing that we do every single day, but we're making progress. And that is what is important. Where do we stand on the the drug use? Because um, Pastor Collins made a comment uh, a while back that um, he found needles and feces on his on, on on church property. Where 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 do you stand on that? Um, how how far along are you coming along with progress and 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 curbing? the drug use? Well, we work on it every day with our police department, but when we make great progress, it's always with our communities and their help and their assistance. Again, I said to the group that asked me this exact same question yesterday, we've got to have communities that are helping us because you know, Ray, we know we know a lot of the folks who are uh, causing some of these problems, right? We, we know, um, but sometimes our police officers need help, need help. Um, I don't want any drug dealer in the city of Charleston, and it is always our focus, but our police officers sometimes need help from our community members. But every single second of every single day, we have a team of folks that work on it from our police department. But police can't solve all of our problems. And I think we all know that, right? We do. But it's cutting off these drug dealers, these drug suppliers that are literally poisoning our children, poisoning our families and getting them out, getting them out of our communities and 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 making them pay for what they've done. Because listen, I am I am a big believer, a big believer in making sure that those who are taking advantage and those who are destroying the lives of our children and our families need to be held accountable. They do. Um, but we need help from our community members. And for those community members who are, because we have so many of them, Ray, who are helping those in the throes of addiction, it's a it's a it's a full time job. Um, it, it is destroying uh, families all across this state and all across this country. It's devastating, devastating. I just got a text message. Oh yeah. And I told I told someone that I'm going to interview you. Oh good. I just got this text message and then we're going to wrap it up. Tell me this. They said, ask Madam Mayor about bringing the Super Six back to Charleston. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. So I don't want to get in trouble with the CVBs. <laughs> <laughs> the visitors. Yeah. Um, gosh, she whiz. I know, I know this. Too. Well, I know this because I'm a former uh, commissioner of tourism for the state of West Virginia. You don't want me to lose basketball, Ray. You want me to focus on basketball. I promise you, you do. You don't want me to lose that. 
Can we compete for the Super Six? You better believe it. But what we're talking about is tourism and travel and sports tourism, right? There is great money in having basketball stay in Charleston, period, end of paragraph. And you have to look at the numbers of people that are coming in and how long they are there. Is it worth it for us to get and invest in getting the Super Six? Yeah, maybe, um, but not as much as keeping basketball. Um, can we go after it? Yeah, we can. Uh, but there are a couple other things that I think that we need to have and we need to go after. Again, you're going to get me in trouble now with every CVB who's going to say I'm coming after their, I'm coming after their uh, <laughs> sports competitions. Yeah. But there are a few others that I believe for the city of Charleston that would have a greater benefit to be here than the Super Six. That's just that's from a tourism and a finance hat and the return on investment. Uh, for every dollar you spend, what am I getting back? Um, basketball is far and away number one, but there are a couple, track uh, is one. So we don't want to lose that because we now have that back. But there are two others that I have my eye on that I think could provide a greater return on investment. Okay. One last thing, and another one <laughs> popped up. And I, I promise I'll let you go. It's okay. The 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 sports complex. Yes. That at, at the Charleston Town Center Mall. Yes. That is t a lot of people are saying that that is by far wonderful. Yeah. Some are saying, what about those kids that they're not able to afford to get in? What, what, yeah. is, what is it? Will, will there be a fee to to get in? to say go play basketball or 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 racquetball or or do other things in that in that in that facility. Well, racquetball. Ra I didn't know you were a racquetball guy, right? Um I'm not really. <laughs> I, now, I, I I play table tennis, but I'm retired. <laughs> I got you. So yeah. it, it's a great, it's a great point. It's the reason why I hired director Ray Sean. She's now not, uh, she's now poor, Ray Sean poor, director poor, uh, who just got married. I say to her all the time, I'm so sorry, I get your name wrong. You just got married and it's going to come to me all the time. But um, director poor and I have worked for four years to ensure that all of our centers are free and open for all of our kids for no fee that they can come and play. And yes, <laughs> we want to make sure that we have all spaces open for kids to play. But if we're going to make sure as well, and so, and so, yes, yes, that is definitely part of that vision. But part of the other vision is to ensure that we are getting thousands and thousands of athletes that are coming in, spending night in hotels, restaurants, shops, and, and traveling in front of your stores, and spending the night uh, and your bed and breakfast, that's the job of the mayor. The job of the mayor is yes, to take care of our local kids. I'm spending $8.2 million turfing 10 fields that kids are gonna start in two, two well, Monday. So three days um, to start playing for free all the time. We are spending millions and millions of dollars to make sure that our kids can play for free um, in top quality spaces all the time. Uh, but part of the mission of this Capital Sports Complex is to create a national level um, facility that I can bring in. Yes, for our kids to compete in, but also to bring in these national tournaments so we can have a tremendous return on investment as well. Because sports tourism industry in 2019 was just like an $18 billion, billion with a B. It now is in 2022, a $40 billion industry that we're not getting any piece of that pie at all. So yes, it is about for sure, making sure that our children have a state of the art, great safe place to play. But if we're going to get a piece of any of this industry and getting people to come to our city, people say all the time, Amy, we need more people coming in our city. This is a $40 billion industry that we're not even getting a taste of. So that's part of our main focus of the Capital Sports Center um, as well. All right. Now, see, I'm done. No more <laughs> questions. No more questions. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks for doing this show. As I say, I watch all the time and I always learn something. And you are such a fabulous and gracious host, Ray. So, and a great person. I can't let you go just yet. Oh, no. I'm going to give you two minutes. Two minutes to, to, to give your final words and thoughts. If there's anything that we haven't talked about, you, you feel free to jump in and, 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 and say it. And please tell the viewers why they should vote for Amy Schuler Goodwin. You ready? Yes. Go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, you know, four years ago, I made a commitment that I would work every day, that I work, work seven days a week, 24-7. And I have. I think that elections are an opportunity, just like we do every year, some of us do in our jobs as a performance review. This is a job interview. An election is a job interview for me. Look at my performance. Look at what we've done. We don't just say it. We do it. I really feel good about what we've done. Yes, we have challenges. Yes, we have a long way to go. But what we've done in four years through a global pandemic is something that I'm extremely proud of. We have worked every second of every single day. You know, this isn't a retirement job. It shouldn't be seen as an end of your career job. I say that all the time. I couldn't do this job 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And the city of Charleston should expect and demand and vote for somebody who's going to treat it as such. This should be a dead sprint. The position that you put me in should be a dead sprint. I'll sprint for another four years, and then I will pass the baton to the next sprinter. But we've never required that of this position, and we should require that of this position. Because if you want to turn things around, if you're going to build and you're going to develop things like reinvesting and developing the riverfront, building a hundred million dollar sports complex, revitalizing um, the West side, an area of the city that needs help the most and the East end, which needs substantial support. It's a sprint. This isn't a marathon. This isn't a luxury time to take your time and make things up as you go. Or when you get there, you'll see. We have incredible people, incredible directors, incredible personnel that work in the city of Charleston that I promise you, I promise you, as my mom likes to say, Ray, hand to the heavens, hand to the heavens. We have people that love this city. I love this city. Some days I'm frustrated. Some days I'm overwhelmed. But our entire goal is to make Charleston vibrant. I said it four years ago, and I'm saying it at the end of four years. You have my promise that that will be our main focus, is to keep the momentum going and to keep turning the city around in the right direction. And I think we're heading there. And so I would love to have uh, your support, um, certainly. Early voting starts in just a couple of days. And of course, Election Day is on the 8th. But also just as important is know your city council people. There are 20 wards and there are six at large council members. Just as important, they get a vote just like I do um, when policies come in front of the public. So they're really important too, to know who your candidates are in your ward and certainly know who your uh, at large candidates are because you can vote for six of them. Thanks, Ray. Madam Mayor. Amy Shula Goodwin, thank you very much for coming out, Voices. You take care and be safe, okay? Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Hold on.